Gross, uh, willkommen in einem and in our Fragen's video. Welcome to another exciting video, in this case episode 13 of my Wargaming Rules Review series of videos. In this video, I'll provide an overview of the Core Commander Operational Maneuver Group Micro Armor Figure Gaming Rules, written by Bruce Retailer in 1986. It was an early attempt at creating a company scale set of rules, although it most resembles a platoon scale set of rules. It was a contemporary of Frank Chadwick's command decision, who released a board game version in the same year. The objective of this video is to allow potential players to determine if these rules are suitable for them by looking at the basic elements of the rules. To assist players in achieving this objective, we must first look at scale, as this affects a host of other factors, such as what type of game you would expect, what amount of movement, and to a lesser extent, the force mixes you require. The next most important factor is the game system, such as sequence of play, visibility, movement, and fire combat systems. This will tell you how historically accurate or otherwise a set of rules are. The next thing to achieve is to understand gameplay, as this tells you how easy or difficult playing a game is. This requires playtesting, as it cannot be derived from reading the rules. This tells you how playable the rules are in terms of long-term play. Learning the rules, an important factor, is a combination of complexity, rules presentation and examples. Simple game systems can be difficult to learn and complex can be easy to learn. So while affected by the complexity of the game system, other factors do come into play which need to be looked at. The final factor to consider is supporting material, which is required for players to create force mixers, set up a game and play the game. Many free rules may be good, but if they lack cheat sheets, equipment lists, army lists and scenarios, then you have to create these. And often players don't bother. Bruce Lee Taylor's Core Commander was the first published core company scale set of rules designed solely for micro armor. Unlike every other set of rules in the scale, this uses a strength point system with each element possessing from 1 to 9 strength points, which unfortunately needed to be kept track of. The system was never popular, even if it had many benefits. While these rules are claimed to be company scale, in most cases elements consisted of 6 strength points, thus I tend to class it as platoon scale, especially for modern conflicts. The strength point system did allow players to feel low value troops at a higher strength, thus reducing the number of elements used, so there was still some benefit over a pure platoon scale set of rules. The main issue with these rules was their sheer complexity, which restricted the game down to regimental size. This was a major disappointment for many players who were hoping to feel divisions. These rules were a masterpiece of game design, but proved to be too ungainly to easily use. Apart from its sheer completeness, its main innovation was the use of strength points and its scale. At 60 minutes a game turn and a ground scale of 1 in 10,000, a player could play a game consisting, uh, spanning an entire day, which was a first for many of these rules. Core Commander uses an element scale which ranges from platoon to company, or to be specific, a half company scale, which allows a player to command a regiment. A player should have no more than 50 elements, so four platoons per company and four companies per battalion gives you two battalions with attached formations or three small battalions. In theory, you should be able to command a small division, but the complexity of the game system precludes that option. The ground scale in Core Commander is 1 centimetre equals 100 metres, which is 1 in 10,000 scale, for 6 mil figures. There is no scale for 15 mil figures, but it's reasonable, a reasonable option is 1 inch equals 100 metres, or a scale of 1 in 3,937. As each player will possess about 30 frontline elements of 2 to 3 centimetre width, that can cover a frontage of 60 centimetres to 90 centimetres. So 90 centimetres is an optimal width for a playing area. The depth depends on the scenario. This assumes any scenario being played will complete within a day. Larger games are possible if you decide for multi-day games. Each game turn represents about 60 minutes. A typical game would last no more than 12 game turns, so 12 game turns can be gamed in a day. This opens up a wide range of tactical situations, which is unusual for micro-armor figure gaming rules of the period. A front line can be broken through in about four to six hours of fighting, so in theory a game could consist of a preliminary preparation, the breakthrough, attack, and a roll-up or deep advance. For 6mm figures, the depth of 120 centimetres or 4 feet is recommended as it gives each side a 30 centimetre player zone and allows for advances up to 60 centimetres. 
A meeting engagement would not need this depth, probably three feet. So if you're going to do a meeting engagement, four feet wide by three feet deep is probably your best option. The sequence of play structure is reasonably simple with fire combat occurring first and then each player alternating their movement afterwards. Within each phase a great deal of complexity resides with the fire phase containing smoke, direct fire, indirect fire, ground to air fire, air to ground fire and a specific breakthrough fire sub phase. Command is a major focus in these rules, with all elements needing to be in command control to communicate, which is required for a wide range of activities, such as calling in fire support, air support and obeying orders. Supply, surprisingly enough, is a major factor in the game, which is unusual for figure gaming rules of the period. Because a game can span a breakthrough and a deep penetration, supply has a more important place for these rules. An attacker can can break through a flank and cut off the supply of the remaining defenders and can, as a result, gain a significant benefit because supply will affect what the defenders can do when they're attacked. The rules use the concept of emplacement for artillery fire support reasons. I think it's a bit complex, but in practice these rules are rarely used. Artillery starts emplaced and will rarely leave that state during a typical game. I expect these rules were designed for multi-day games involving divisions. The, game initial, the game's initial charter was to allow a player to command a core. This is simply not possible, and even a division can result in the game which can easily take more than three days, real days, to play. It's nice to have this capability, but the rules to support this are rarely used. During the communication subphases, orders are issued. The order rules are very vague and players would typically need to agree to additional house rules. But headquarters can have attack, defend, manoeuvre and retreat orders. The restrictions relating to these orders are the vague aspect and often these rules are simply never used. During the artillery communication subphase, requests for fire support are made. In simple terms, a request for fire support is made and during the following game turn can be executed. Historically accurate, but the result record keeping is annoying. The other issue is what happens when the target moves. This is a bit unclear. In practice, this is not that much of an issue as players often only have one to two indirect fire elements to consider and they will always retain the same fire support mission. But once again, a lot of rules for minimal effect. Calling in air support is similar to fire support. The one game turn or game turn delay requires record keeping, but is otherwise reasonably straightforward. The observation rules are incredibly detailed and historically accurate, but complex. Once you get the calculation out of the ways, these rules offer an extraordinary level of detail, which I've never seen in any other set of rules before. The issue is the rules are very complex when you play a game. In simple terms, each element has a base observation range. So a tank in open terrain has a BOR of 8 centimetres. Then you apply a net observation modifier to this value. This is a long list of modifiers, but the result is then multiplied by the BOR. So our tank in the open, which has a BOR of 8, would normally have an OM, or observation modifier of 4, resulting in an observation range of 32 centimetres. As you can see, while the chart is complex, it covers an astounding number of situations, including the use of night vision equipment, weather, poor visibility and terrain. I feel these rules are simply too complex, but they achieve an astounding level of detail. So if that's your objective, these definitely are the rules you should consider. The initiative rules are reasonably standard, with the winner having some additional flexibility in terms of movement order. The interesting addition is the concept of giving a different army lists specific attack and defence modifiers, which does add a bit of flavour to the game with minimal complexity. The final special rules are the concept of breakthrough. If a breakthrough is achieved by an unusually high initiative, that player gains an additional or an advantage in terms of fire combat, which can be critical. The rules do possess a morale system which all elements with all elements having a morale between 1 and 10 with higher value morale able to pass a morale test easier. Morale needs testing when you need to rally an element and if an element suffers high losses or is subject to MBC attack. Morale is tested immediately or during the morale phase for some causes. The actual test uses a reasonably long list to modify and the results range from no effect to rally disruption and finally surrender. 
I find the morale rules also rather complex, but as long as your force mix is small enough, it's not really a major issue. The biggest issue is remembering to conduct the test when they are required. The movement system is also unusually complex, with all elements being associated a movement or mobility code which is cross-referenced with terrain covered, which gives you a final value. There is a long list of movement modifiers which are used based on the mode of the element, the type of movement, other activities the element conducts, and a number of terrain modifiers. The result is very historical and detailed, but it is unnecessarily complex and difficult to calculate, especially if cross you are crossing different terrain types. The aircraft rules are also very detailed, with air-to-air -air combat and the full gamut of ground-to-air and air-to-ground combat allowed. The rules that uses the concept of missions, which are a mix of aircraft type activity and when you can conduct that particular mission. It's rather confusing and complex, but I have attempted to provide a full simplified game of the missions in my example documents for these rules. Aircraft arrival is either pre-planned or called in using a system similar to artillery. Both players first deploy all aircraft to their attack or observation point. CAP are not deployed on the playing area. Their combat occurs off the playing area. Air-to-air -air combat is first conducted. This is a complex system of aircraft lining up against any opponents and excess aircraft or surviving aircraft available to attack any enemy aircraft on the playing area. Generally, one side achieves air supremacy and leftover aircraft can attack enemy aircraft deployed on the playing area. Enemy aircraft can have close escorts, which result in more air-to-air -air combat. After all air-to-air -air combat, all remaining cap and Close escort aircraft are removed. Surviving aircraft can now continue with aircraft combat. Ground-to-air combat occurs first, followed by air-to-ground combat. There is a lot more complexity than I can describe here, but I find aircraft combat both rather detailed and far too complex. Once again, if the force mixes are low, which is recommended, the whole process is a lot simpler. For example, it's rare to have opposing aircraft over the playing area at the same time. And when there is an attack, it's normally only a few aircraft flights that you need to deal with. Aircraft or indirect fire can be under one of three mission area interdiction or fire support missions. In addition, artillery can conduct self-observed indirect fire where they are sighting the target and conducting indirect fire against it. Obviously, artillery can also conduct direct fire if the weapon allows. Finally, we have counter-battery fire, which is aimed at enemy artillery, which has been located by an artillery ranging element or enemy headquarters, which has been intercepted by a radio intercept element. Area or interdiction fire is pre-planned, with the target and game turn of arrival stipulated before the game. For fire support is the most common mission, and most artillery would be under this mission at all times. In this case, an observer calls in fire support. Self-observed indirect fire is self-explanatory, but observer-sighted fire is more complex. A player gives an artillery element a fire support mission. This is normally set before the game and remains for the entire game. Being only interrupted during the game turns, it may be required to conduct area or interdiction fire. Once the mission is sent, the artillery is linked by radio, telephone or perhaps messengers to the observer, which can be any element under a headquarters or only the headquarters and any special element subordinate to it. This depends on nationality. If an observer sights a target, it can call in fire support during the indirect fire subphase. This is a detailed, accurate but complex system. It works and once you're an experienced player, it's easy to use, but understanding it takes a lot of effort. Counter-battery fire is designed to target enemy artillery, which has been firing at you. Surprisingly, it's rarely used. But if used, an artillery element is given a counter-battery mission, and each time an enemy open fire, it can attempt to locate it. It can pro prove useful, but means an artillery element is out of action for the game, in most cases. It's possible to change the mission, but in practice, if you're going to conduct counter-battery, you do not change the mission. The indirect fire, indirect fire combat system is the same as direct fire but uses its own column and is rather complex. 
We first identify a column which requires us to cross-reference the defender strength with the strength of the firer. If the target is DEF3, or Defence Strength 3, we use the 3 to 6 row. If we are firing with FE6, or Fire Effectiveness of 6, then we move across the row until we get to 5 to 6. That is our row, or column. This row can be modified, left or right, based on the list of indirect fire modifiers to arrive at the final modified column. We then cross-reference this column with our strength, which if it was strength 6, the result would be 4. That is our fire column. Armed with our final fire value of 4, which we derived earlier, we now go to the fire loss table and spin a D10 and cross-reference this result. Let's say the result is 6. With our fire value of 4, we arrive at a D, which means the target is dispersed, or takes one strength point loss. This is not a simple combat system, but is a clever way of representing so many dimensions. As we need to cross-reference the target defence with the firer's fire effectiveness and strength, and then spin a dice to give us a fourth dimension, I find it simply too complex, but if the force mix is kept low, it's certainly manageable. And look, I have to admit, once you get used to the system, you actually memorise a lot of stuff pretty quickly. Direct fire execution is reasonably standard, but the game system provides up to eight ranged fire values, and for ATG jub, uh, anti-tank guard weapons, a further one more. It also provides a fire value for close combat. When firing, you either use anti-tank or anti-infantry fire values, depending on the target type. A third value is also provided for anti-tank guided missiles. This is a detailed direct fire combat system, which even a squad scale set of rules would be hard put to match. When firing, identify the target, the weapons row, and cross-reference that with the range to provide a fire effectiveness value. You now go to the direct fire table and find the defensive effectiveness of the target. Once we've identified that row, we now run across the row until you reach the fire effectiveness value, which we identified earlier. For example, a DEF 9, that's a defensive 9, and a fire effectiveness to 12 results in column 8. There is a long list of modifiers which can shift to the left and right. Once we have identified our final column, we then cross-reference this with the strength of the attacker, which is 6, which if it was 6, the result is 12. We now move over and use the same fire loss table as used in indirect fire. In our example, if we spun a 6, the result would be 2, which is 2 casualties, and in most cases requires a morale test. Remember, our final column is 12, so we cross-reference 12 with 6, which results 2. This is, once again, not simple. But if the number of combats are low, it's certainly manageable. Considering the truly enormous detail contained in the rules, these rules are surprisingly condensed. The format is reasonable, but the rules do not lend themselves to learning the rules easily. These need an example document, which is available on the Core Commander IO group site. So the learning aspect can be covered using that document. Once we are experienced, the rules are good, short, condensed, and reasonably easy to find critical rules in them when you need them. But you do need the examples document close by in case you forget the process of a given complex action. There are a lot of special rules, mainly related to weapon types. Keeping track of all these rules, exceptions and special conditions is very hard. For example, recon elements can move as if concentrated while dispersed and elements in travel mode fire with only one strength point. These are real a down point of the rules, that is special rules. And actually, in all due honesty, all special rules cause problems. The issue is just how many are there and how important they are. And in this case, there are a lot and they're fairly significant. Possibly the biggest issue with these rules are strength points. Each element needs to have its strength point tracked, which in large games is almost impossible. There are also a large number of other counters required. This is not a strength of the rules, and often players who finally abandon these rules abandon it because of the difficulty of tracking strength points. In terms of a summary, the basic sequence of play is simple, but within several phases there is a surprising level of complexity. This is manageable, so I would class these rules as average in terms of sequence of play complexity. 
One of the main issues is that you need to be able to do reasonably complex maths in your head when you calculate observation. In some cases, movement and even fire combat requires some level of maths to determine. Your head will hurt at the end of the game, but if you play these rules enough, you'll become a super genius, at least in terms of being able to calculate things in your head. The rules contain a significant amount of information, including army lists. The period is limited, but there are a wide range of army lists available on the Corps Commander IO Group site, and as a result, this is a real strength of the rules. When you buy the rules, you get a lot of army list information. The rules contain an extensive equipment list for the element types listed in the army list. In addition, a massive amount of equipment lists are provided on the Corps Commander IO Group site. This is another strength of these rules. There is a separate scenario book, which if you can't obtain, obtain may be an issue. However, there is a large amount of scenarios on the Corps Commander IO Group site, so once again, I consider this another strength of the rules in terms of scenarios. Corps Commander can only be described as a work of art. It contains so much detail and historical accuracy, the rules are closer to a guide for a, a real regimental commander in terms of how to command a regiment or brigade than an actual game. I cannot exaggerate how accurate and good these rules are. They are not perfect. Air-to-air -air combat is far too bloody, but these are not even air war rules, so to achieve that level of detail and accuracy in air-to-air -air combat is astounding. On the other hand, as a set of playable rules, it falls short. This detail and complexity makes both learning and playing a game difficult. If the force mix is small enough and a player makes a reasonable effort in learning the rules, you will get a good game. But this is an amount of effort that modern gamers are generally unwilling to make. These are great but difficult rules. I've created a massive material to assist players in learning and playing the game all on the Core Command IO group site, but even with this material, few casual players would make the effort. I have created a version of Core Commander called Core Commander version 5, which has attempted to simplify as much of the game system without removing anything. This project has been kind of successful, but the result is still a difficult set of rules, and as such, players who already know Core Commander are better off remaining with the original rules, and new players would generally not wish to make the investment required to learn rules as complex as these regardless. After this less than successful experience, and almost by accident, I then created a quick play version of Core Commander called Core Commander version 6. These, while retaining as much of the detail as possible, are significantly easier to learn and play. I consider the result a, a reasonable or resounding success, and have used them many times. My only minor issue is the use of strength points, which I still feel represents an annoying level of administration. However, ignoring that, these quick play rules work well and are also on the Core Commander IO Group site. The Core Commander rules are unique, more so than any other set of rules I've reviewed. No other rules I'm aware of contains this level of detail at this scale, and the closest comparison I can think of is Frank Chadwick's command decision. There is no really official site for Core Commander. Bruce unfortunately passed away many years ago. However, you will be able to find a reasonable amount of information in Wiki if you're interested. And there is also a pseudo-official site on IO Groups called Core Commander. In terms of obtaining the rules, you can't purchase them anymore. They've been out of print for many years. But you can download a copy from ScribeDB as well as purchase second-hand versions from various sites around the world. The only community around these rules is the one on IO Group. The site contains a huge amount of supporting material, game guides, training material, example guides, and errata, and reformatted versions of the rules for those interested. And so this concludes episode 30, my video series on game rules. In this case, a specific analysis of the Core Commander Micro Armor Figure Gaming rules. Alla guten Ding! Kommen zu einem Ende!